a moral relativist is somebody who thinks, um, first of all, that there is no single true morality, um, um, but secondly, there are a variety of possible moralities, um, and um, and we should. It isn't that we should abandon morality the way an atheist thinks, for example, we should abandon religion or theism anyway. Um, we, should, uh, we should adopt a morality and we should accept it, but realize it's not the only uh, possible morality and it's not the single true morality. Some people say that um, moral relativism is the view that there's uh, no single uh, correct morality. There are all these different moralities, and um, it's, it's that plus the view that we ought to uh, respect other people's morality, where the second thing is treated as a absolute moral principle that holds no matter what your moral view is. So in that it, that kind of uh, statement of moral relativism is inconsistent because the first part says there isn't a single true morality, and then the second part says, well, there is this much that's a sing part of a single true morality, namely you've got to respect everybody's moral view. Our own moral background determines how we see other people. If we didn't have this background, we wouldn't have a framework to praise or condemn anyone. It's very good that we have different cultures. It's very good that people have different attitudes for lots and lots of reasons. It makes, uh, it makes the world more interesting. It makes literature and art more interesting, that people have these rather different ways of looking at things. But we can value differences in culture without subscribing to what is, to my mind, a pernicious view that our moral opinions have got to stop at our own borders. But to say where tolerance should stop poses a tricky problem in the other direction. Can anyone be sure that a moral standard he thinks should be absolute doesn't reflect his own cultural bias? At a minimum, moral relativism seems to offer the advantages of encouraging open-mindedness and tolerance. But taken to extreme, it also seems to sanction actions that we feel are deeply wrong. Is there some way to keep the advantages of relativism, but define core values that apply to everyone? Here's what I think can be learned from cultural relativism. In the first place, we shouldn't assume that every practice of our culture is based on some objective, rational standard. There are many practices in our culture that are nothing more than uh, than cultural products. And it, it's easy to, to give a, examples. Um, we're wearing clothes, we're not naked. This is just a cultural, uh, uh, this, is, this is just a cultural matter. There, there would be nothing at all morally wrong if we were sitting here without shirts on. Uh, it would be nothing at all morally wrong if, if we were sitting here totally un unclothed. I mean, aesthetically, it might not be very nice, but there would be nothing immoral about it. So there, there are, there are uh, cultural standards that do not rest on any objective right or wrong. Once you realize that, you um, um, are free to, to consider whether other more important things might also uh, rest on uh, nothing more than, than just cultural uh, prejudices. The distinction between science and ethics is often viewed as having to do with facts versus feelings. One school of ethics contends that all moral judgments are ultimately expressions of personal feeling or emotion. Emotivists, as these philosophers are called, point to differences in how people use language. On the one hand, there are statements of fact. The game begins at two o'clock, or all the tickets have been sold. The facts may not always be clear, but ultimately there are ways to settle disagreements. On the other hand, 
there are statements that express people's feelings. Get that dumb ref off the field, or go for it, Jimmy. These statements aren't being used to establish facts. They express the speaker's emotions. For an emotivist, statements in ethics are like that. According to emotivism, moral statements have two main functions. They express our emotions and they they offer guidance to people on uh, concerning what to do. So if, if I say um, killing is wrong, it's really as though I had said killing, ich, I'm expressing my emotion, and also I'm asking you not to kill. So saying killing is wrong is like saying killing, ugh, don't do it. Right? Now notice that an expression of emotion is, is neither true nor false. That's an analysis of moral judgments. Does saying that mean that you're abandoning ethics or dismissing ethics or uh, in some way uh, suggesting that ethics does not have the importance that um, uh, people might have thought? No, it, it's just offering an account of what ethics is. I can be a logical positivist and I can go right on uh, uh, being opposed to murder. I could go right on being a nice person. I could go right on being horrified by lying and, and uh, cheating and stealing. Uh, I can have exactly the same views that I always had, and I can hold those views with the same uh, fervor that I have always uh, held them. I just have a particular philosophical understanding of what I'm doing when I make a moral judgment. Everyone implicitly recognizes that there is a question of reasonable and unreasonable choice and action. So emotivism can't be the, the answer. Emotions can't be the criterion of worth, of, mm -hmm. of right and good. Often it's not just a choice of imposing our values or just saying, okay, you do it your way. <laughs> uh, I think there are ways of both expressing uh, what we believe and um, trying to adjust what we do uh, according to a, a respect for what others may believe, especially when we see powerful reasons for what, for what they believe. Should we invade to stop? Should we kill people in order to stop them from killing people? These are all very, very serious questions. Nobody can be confident about them. But let's keep separate the question, is it right morally to disapprove? And the answer to that must be yes. Because if we don't disapprove morally, we don't believe what we ourselves think.